And I ain't hit no drop in a minute. No, I'm back my business. Rappers Got Podcast, episode 45. Yes, 45. 45. 45. 45. All right, today we wanted to talk about... Oh, first off, I'm your host, Diggy Mastro. <laughs> Bales Pagliacci. All right, today I wanted to talk about uh, the cheapening of music and why older music is still selling more than the newer music. Yep. Uh, what are your first thoughts on it? Why? <sighs> My first thoughts is, at this point in the industry... I mean, I, I don't want to just say the industry. I want to just say entertainment itself. Everything is being remade, like, constantly over and over again. And when you do certain things like that, all it kind of does is for the people that were around beforehand, it makes them want to go back to the original song or that original piece of work. Like, I think they're about to make a new Top Gun, another fucking Batman movie. Yeah, for sure. I think nostalgia as a whole sells. And, yeah. like, every company knows that nostalgia sells. So that's why, like, even Chips, bro, they'll, like, bring back, like, uh, Doritos 3D. Yeah. Right? I've been seeing like, them shit. Yeah, those were, like, the shit when we were younger. They don't even taste the same, but they brought them back. You know yeah. what I mean? They bring back everything, and I think that that has something to do with it. But I also think that um, where we're at with music, I feel like shit is super cheap because it's just like constant, all right, let's just bang out as much content as possible. And mm-hmm. we preach that. Yep. But there does come like a, a negative with that, which is the music doesn't hold as much value. Exactly. But I also don't think that the music holds value on these platforms. So that's why we're forced to do this. Mm-hmm. You know, if music held value or like people were still buying physical copies and stuff like that, I think that we would be more likely to sit down and make a full album that has all the content, uh, has the the song for the ladies, has the club record, has... But now it's kind of just like a free-for-all, two-minute records... You know what I mean? Like, there's no actual structure anymore. And I think that that also has to do with why these older songs... And that always bothered me. Like, yo, people would be like, uh, when the two-minute song started becoming a thing, I remember people would be like, yeah, I I want it to be two minutes because I want it to have that replay value. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, all right, so if someone is willing to replay a song that's two minutes three times, why wouldn't they listen to a six-minute record? (sighs) I try to listen to some old school music sometimes that be having like those four minute, five minute songs. And yes, for the most part, they keep me there. But I think at this point, within how everything has changed within the landscape of music, my ADHD for listening to music kicks in and it's like, I'm just going to go to the next track. Yeah, but I don't... See, this is the the issue that I have. It's like, you don't have to listen to the full song. Yeah, but then if you feel like you'd be cheating out the artist a little bit when you skip past it. I Well, not on a platform. I mean... Once you get past seconds. like the 30 seconds, <laughs> you, you gave that, them yeah, the play. So it doesn't really fucking matter, you know? And if you guys didn't know that, uh, 30 seconds counts as a play on streaming platforms. So in order to have a play, someone has to reach the 30 second mark. If they play it and it sounds bad and they turn it off, doesn't count as a play. Yeah, so a lot of you guys can literally just use that to your advantage. Sometimes if you got a hard hitting beat, you don't even really have to say anything in the intro in the beginning. You can literally let that ride a little bit. And I also think um, I was on Twitter the other day, and I think Z, shout out Z from DJ Booth, he said that uh, majority of hits have the chorus come in before the 50-second mark. Yeah. So that's another thing that you guys should take note of. A lot of hits have um, the chorus or the hook come in before the 50-second mark. So if you're trying to structure your records or trying to figure out what you should be doing, um, that might be a good stepping stone to to creating that first like hit record that you have. Yeah, don't let it be 30, 50 seconds and you're still saying, yo, about to start rapping. That'd right. be crazy. Or you're letting the beat rock. Just rock the entire time. Another thing I want to say. I don't know why this just uh, came into my head, but and we probably talked about this on here, but yo, if you guys are putting out clips to like market, like stop putting the introductory beat as the marketing clip. Yeah. It's just always a bad idea. You got to give a little bit more. You got to give more substance a little bit more. You have to give them the part of the song that's exciting. Yeah. You know, if the beat is the most exciting part of the entire song, then you probably didn't make a good song. Exactly. You know what I mean? Like A lot of times, a lot of people do try to use that to skate by and just kind of float over it. So, Well, they they try to do this like climactic thing where it's like the beat kind of like carries and then right before the verse starts, they cut off the clip and it's like, oh, coming soon. Yeah. No one's coming back. You got to like hit them straight to the cut. <laughs> you got to hit them with the chorus back. or like, like, like a hard part of that verse. Yeah, the you mistake you just instant. made is that is that when you said coming soon, no one's coming soon back to that track. <laughs> like it's over for you. Like you had to grab them with that clip. If you're trying to grab someone with a clip, 
trust me, like, yo, people are not just waiting to come back and listen to one of your records. Like, they're they're trying to hear what they want to hear right then and there. That ad, you might only get in front of that person's eyes one time. Mm -hmm. So if your ad doesn't have any of you on it and just has a beat, you lost them. Very much. You know what I mean? so. So another just, like, key tip, like, when you're making that marketing clip for Instagram or TikTok or whatever, try to play, like, the best part of your verse or try to play the best uh, part of the chorus or whatever and try to grab them like that because you might actually be successful in grabbing them in mm-hmm. and keeping them there to listen to the full record once it comes out. But uh, going back to like the old versus new, you know, we talked about it in our stat talk episode, you know, like 70,000, upper 70,000 songs is coming out daily, right? Mm-hmm. And once again, how the whole artistry mode has kind of developed itself to is more like that influencer branding because once again you can make money in music but for the most part you make a lot of money outside of music at the same time like and you're just using that as the the foundation to get there and I feel like that's another reason why the old versus new thing it's like more people are more focused on the antics or I'm, I don't let me not use the word antics more focused on the business strategies outside of the music or try to you know home in on that specific thing was it just music 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 but back then it was a whole different story because the labels we're in charge okay. of making sure those big I was name just, acts. Okay, I was just about to say what you just ended that with. Back then, labels were very responsible for the full package. Exactly. They packaged the music. They made sure that the album cover was dope. They made sure that it had music videos that carried it. They made sure that everything was kind of together. And I think that nowadays you have a bunch of young people that are doing it with zero budget. And they're trying to make it just content so yep. that they could put it out. So you don't have this like... Like, yo, a label will literally put you in the room with the best producer in the world mm-hmm. to work on a record for for your first album, right? Where, like, you don't have access to that when you're a young artist. So I think that if we're looking at older music and why it was more successful is because there was no real, like, uh, independent artist back in the day yep, that exactly. just were doing it all themselves. There was label-run artists, and they had access to all the marketing and all the everything. So the, the package was different, you know? And it turned into the Wild Wild West, technically, as, you know, time went on. But at the same time, it's a positive thing. But then you'll also start seeing the negative sides of it, where this, this information just came out. It was like, oh, the old older songs have more replay value, and they, in a sense, mean a little bit more than everything that's new coming out. And once again, I think that always comes back to just... Everybody's trying to get those hits out, get noticed out pretty quickly and having those songs con- constantly come out over and over and over again. And once again, that is something we preach and that's something you should be doing. But at a certain point, it should become a... Once you get, gain that foundation or you gain that structure, okay, how can I have a little bit more longevity in this game? And how can I make those timeless records or those classic records in a sense that people are going to... 10, 15 years from now, they're going to go back to this and it's going to remind them of something. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. I, I feel like everyone's worried about... Th- uh, capturing the nostalgia, but no one's worried about people capturing the nostalgia of their record in the future. Exactly. You know, like we all want that sample that's going to be memorable in the future. And it does happen where like, like for instance, uh, there's a dope ass artist out of Atlantic city named Pooh propane, mm-hmm. uh, shout out Pooh. And he sent me a record that he, he actually put it out, but it had the, um, you don't know. What you know, do that Jay Z uh, sample? Turn my music hot. Oh, okay, now there you go. Thank you. All you, right. know how, you know how I be. All right, cool. He sent me that, and that's a record that was a sample when Jay Z hopped on it. Mm-hmm. But when you hear it now, that sample reminds you of Jay Z. It doesn't mm-hmm. remind you of the original artist. Exactly. So, I guess you could create that sort of nostalgia, where in ten years people view that sample as your record instead of viewing it as the original record who the sample's Which from. Which can eventually happen. For sure. But you have to make such a good record to do that. You know, and I don't I don't know, man. I feel like people play on the, the nostalgia of the original song way too much instead of just making their own new version Rendition of it. Rendition of it, yep. You know, and, and you see that very often where, like, they copy the hook and they try to make, like, the hook sound very similar so that, like, it encapsulates the whole nostalgia factor of mm-hmm. the record. But it's like, create a new song with it. And, you know, going back to the episode we had with Sue, as far as, like, the samples, it's like, you know, yeah, Jay-Z could probably get a, get away with that or any other bigger name artist mm-hmm. maybe get away with it. But it's like, on our level, um, without being able to get that permission, it becomes a thing where it's just like, even if it does blow up, you could, once again, run into those legal troubles. And 
it doesn't seem like a bad idea to try to grab onto something that you know had history with you as far as the sample goes and trying to utilize it for yourself. But then once again, we're talking about two different ball games at that point as far as where you're at in your artistry and what could potentially be the downfall of you using those samples, whatever the case may be. Unless you're using like a track lib. Exactly. Did we talk about track lib? Uh, no, I don't think we did. I mean, we talked about it like previous episodes, but anybody mentioned it specifically on that episode. Okay. Well, if you're a young artist at home and you do like using samples, go on TrackLib and just check out their like um, how it works video. Because essentially there's like, there's a, a library of like 100,000 songs, uh, stems broken down. Uh, and then once you're about to put the record out, in order to get sample clearance, you pay based on what tier the record was in. There's mm -hmm. like tier A, which is all like the big records b is like mid-level and then c would be like these unknown records that um the artist didn't really blow up but they might still have some dope uh melodies and stuff like that and basically you pay uh upfront cost and then you give a percentage of the publishing yeah of that record over to the the artist like the original and i think that the fact that that's readily available for everyone means that we don't have to go forward stealing samples and getting fucked by it. You know what I mean? I think that that we can go forward and actually um, do it the right way. And it's affordable enough to where an artist, like I think that T or C is like 50 bucks. Yeah, and on top of that, they said like the most of their content um, is in between that B and C tier, where mostly everything is in C. So it's like at that point, everything becomes like, affordable. Yeah, they said like 90% is in T or yeah. C. So 90% of the, the samples that you would find on there would be like 50 bucks. And then depending on the amount of time that you take from the sample, it would be like 10%, 20%, or 30%, I think is the highest. That, or it might be 5, 10, and, and uh, 20. Yeah, because one thing that like, we always want to remind you guys is like music, but business. Music, business. That business portion is always what's honestly going to dictate your career and where it goes. And, um, you know, it's not like a sponsored video by Tracklib, but if you are, listen, holla at us. But besides that, you know what I'm saying? You got to make sure that business is in place and these things are available to us. And this is why we try to share that information so you can utilize it for yourself so you don't end up in some trouble or end up in a situation where it's like, ah, I don't know what, what I should do from here or why didn't I do this thing differently? So at my, uh, at my career, we have people that have been at the career for a long time and they do shit wrong, mm -hmm. right? And I keep on saying... You know, sometimes you got to remove people that do shit wrong that have been here for a long time so that when new people come in, you yeah, could just exactly. train them correctly and then they could just work the right way exactly. from the jump. They don't even know the wrong way because they've never seen it before. Mm -hmm. Now, if you are coming up and you're a producer and you're trying to do sample-based shit, right, rather than do it all the wrong way, you start with TrackLib and you have all your samples cleared and it's ready to go. You're going to have an easier career. Yes. Because also labels look at people who have their business in order and they're more likely, not, not always, because labels do also like get a one over on you. Mm -hmm. But labels do like a person who has their business in order where it's not a liability to work with this artist because you're not going to run into a bunch of lawsuits or whatever. So you might just be looking out for your, your own future if you do sit there and... Um, get all your samples cleared before you even really start up. You know what I mean? And a key word is right there is like leverage. As when you have your business in order and you got your artistry in order, both of those things are together. It's like you you can't walk into a place or let me walk into a label and feel like, oh, I have to just specifically be here. You got the leverage in your hand. And that's one of the things we have to understand as artists. You have the leverage if you choose to walk the, the, walk the right path. A hundred percent. Do you remember when Corey was talking about how he likes working with um, artists who have marketed themselves before yeah. because that it makes it easier for like the whole explanation the whole, exactly. and breakdown and the, the whole process is easier. I think that if you walk into a label meeting and you understand sample clearances and you understand publishing and you understand all these things, I think it makes it easier for them to work with you because it's like, okay, so we don't have to explain all these processes to this person. Mm -hmm. We don't have to actually like, have the the legal troubles or have the fights with them once we are charging certain things that they don't even understand, but it's really just like due practice. It's like, um, oh, well, you didn't get 17,000 extra on this record because the sample, sample needed to was, be cleared. Yep. That's why it started at 50, and then you, know, you, you end up with 33 because the sample had to be cleared for 17 grand. So 
that's something that if you know before you walk in, I think it just makes it easier to be in the conversation. And this is something that has popped up in my head. Um, I know that this whole thing that's going on right now, right, uh, with like Spotify, that kind of goes back to the old versus new music, right? I don't know who the fuck Neil Young is. I really have no idea, but I'm pretty sure he was. A, you would know him if you heard some of his records. Old artist, like classic, yeah, classic old artist. So he basically wanted to rip his songs down um, from Spotify just to the, the Joe controversy Rogan with Joe Rogan, show. right? Yep. And then he's getting all his other big name older artists that yeah. was back then trying to get their music off of those platforms, and then basically Joe Rogan comes out and apologizes, right? Yep. And it just goes to show, like. <laughs> number one, the power of that older music. Cause it's like, if that was probably like a new age artist, they're probably like, oh, okay, you could take your music off those streaming platforms. But having that older artist that has like that long catalog and knowing that people are going to that catalog constantly, that's actually losing the money. And I don't know if it's gonna offset the amount of money they may have See, made from Joe that's Rogan. That's what I wonder. That's what I wonder. How much money are they actually losing? You know what I mean? Like these subscriptions aren't exactly expensive. So how much money are they really losing in the long run? You know, like, can Spotify stay strong and just be like, well, we're riding with our guy? Fuck off. You know what I mean? If you want to go over there and do your thing, sure. You're going to have less followers. You're going to mm -hmm. have less listeners. I just think... I think Spotify is such a big platform that, like, these artists also don't understand what they are. You know what I mean? Like, Also true. Like, I understand who, who Neil Young is, but, like, does, does Neil Young understand who Spotify is? I think he does, but I think that's the... That's that issue right there. And I think that's where those, if like I said, once again, if all those bigger name artists from back then and with the power of what their music is able to do now over this newer music, I think that is very powerful as far For as sure. being able to take that shit, take that shit away. And I mean, I know like fucking Apple Music had instantly just put up some shit like a Neil Young playlist. Like, you know, come over here if you want to listen to Neil Young to get those right. subscribers. Right, and that's that competitive. That's, that's, that's yeah. that, how the business works. But it just goes to show <laughs> the, the power of that older music and what it could actually do. And how we, you know, as artists today, yes, we want to make things quick, 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 quick. But we also got to remember at a certain point, we want to have more longevity. Well, for me, for me specifically, 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 thank you. There you go. For me specifically, I would have, I would want to have some longevity because, you know, I, I love, I love this shit. I think that um, it reminds me of, of uh, Walmart versus Rubbermaid, right? Yeah. Rubbermaid garbage cans and, and all that shit. Like they made a bunch of plastic products. And um, they wanted Walmart. Walmart was trying to get their stuff for ridiculously cheap. Mm -hmm. And they said, nah, we can't do that. And they said, you're going to do it or you're not going to have a company anymore. Yeah, we ain't gonna sell you and shit. Rubbermaid stood their ground and they're no longer in business right and now. And that stock plummeted like a motherfucker. And now the benefit that like Neil Young would have is that he's... He's kind of already like built his audience to where they're not going away. Mm -hmm. But at what point? And now, here's another thing. Do you expect all of like Neil Young's fans? I don't know how old Neil Young is, but do you expect his fans to be listening to Spotify? You know what's funny as shit? I just asked my mom like two days ago, like, does she know what streaming is? And she was like, what are you talking about? Yeah, my, mom, my mom's 60-something. <laughs> she don't listen to it. It's like, what do you mean what am I talking about? You know what the fuck streaming is? My mom doesn't is? have Spotify. You know what I mean? She doesn't have Apple Music. They she doesn't have any of that shit. shit. Yeah, she still rock with CDs yeah. or she'll listen on like YouTube because that like makes sense to her. Like she doesn't have any of that stuff. I think she might like listen to iHeartRadio or something like that. Mm -hmm. But like, I don't know how many Neil Young fans are actually on Spotify. I mean, we could check. You could check his his I mean, monthly I mean, listeners. At this point, he took all his shit off, so I don't know. Yeah, so it would be, it'd be difficult. But like, I would wonder. Point. I would wonder what his monthly listeners were and how much they're actually losing by losing those people. And now, how devoted are the fans? Yeah, I heard that they was canceling so many subscriptions that Spotify had to shut down. Like, you can't. Yeah, they did some like sketchy back end shit. Yeah, so I don't know, man. But yeah. I don't think that was a Neil Young thing. I think that was a fuck Joe Rogan thing. It could be a lot of it could be a lot of correlation because he, he was on I think it was COVID a fuck shit. Joe Rogan yeah. thing. So yeah, it could be a lot of I things. don't think it had anything to do with Neil Young. I think Neil Young is the first person to be like, oh, I'm Being not a, doing this. He's this big name. But I don't think it had as much to do with Neil Young as it had to do with, yo, it's fuck Joe Rogan. He's spreading this and that. We're gonna cancel our subscription. I also have an issue with that because there's so many artists that you're supporting. Mm -hmm. By being on those platforms, yeah, that like over one person that you disagree with, you're gonna just like not support your favorite artist anymore. 
And even taking further than that, I was thinking like, yo, let's just say some shit happened like where he like Neil Young got all the fucking music music guys like back out and shit. It's like technically that kind of fucks me over because I've been building a fucking following on Spotify this entire time. Cause that's what people have been saying. Build a following on Spotify, get those followers. I don't think it fucks you over because I don't think that human beings as a whole, they're they're not gonna just leave Spotify. Yeah, I don't feel like they would that would either. But I you was know, like, what if in a world, what if though? Like companies do go out of business. That's what I was thinking about. Like how many people? Yeah, but not not Spotify. They've they've built too big of a platform. They have too much money behind them. And they all, all over the country. Yeah, like, it, like the, the world. Yeah, yeah the, the world. I meant to say. But yeah, there's there's no way that you kill a Spotify by taking a couple like legacy acts down. I just don't see that happening. You know what's funny though? Like there's so many breakdowns of of uh, what makes money in the music industry. Like I remember last year or maybe two years ago, we had that like stat that it was like 85% of the income in music came from independent artists. Mm -hmm. And then it's like X amount of percentage uh, of people still listen to older music over newer music. At what point? All right. So check this out. If you're a fan of this artist from back in the day, right? Mm -hmm. I don't know about you, but I got to a point where like, I'm not exactly running to new music as soon as it comes Definitely out. Definitely not. So I think that's an age-based thing. I think that when it comes to listening to new music, when you get to a certain age, you're not, you kind of hear it when you hear it. It doesn't become priority. Yeah. I remember when we were younger, I would be on the hot new hip hops and all these different yeah. websites to hear what dropped on Fridays. I still will, will open up my Spotify sometimes and go to like new releases. See if anything cool drop. But for the most part, like, you're not rushing. At our age, you're not rushing to Spotify unless one of the big artists drops a song. Bro, I don't give a fuck who you are as an artist. I am not waiting up to 12 o'clock at night just to hear your music. That's a fact. I will wait till the fucking next day, two yeah. or three days after it. Well, I also think that that's, that's another thing that, like, we're past that age where, like, yeah. we have to be first to listen to it. Because yeah. you realize, like, what the fuck does that even do for you? It doesn't really... Nothing. You listen to the album eight hours before me, I'll be fine. And on top of that, you got to listen to the album at least, like, 10, 20 times before you can really digest the shit. You can't just listen to yeah. it at first. So I'll get to it when I get to it. You all right with that. Yeah, I think that that was a young thing that we used to do. But I also feel like uh, when you're at our age, I just don't think you're rushing to new music. And I don't think that like, I think that that might play a part in why older music does better than. Here's another head like, crack. You, you just got to, you just got to look at the fact that like everyone ages, you know what I mean? And like, we're all getting older and I don't think that like, I don't know how that applies to kids, but I also don't, don't think kids. They have too many options. I don't think. Kids always have this, uh, the streaming platforms. Yeah, because that technically costs money. You have to pay for it. But if your kid doesn't have a job, how the fuck are they paying for streaming platforms? Now their parents could buy it, but a lot of kids' parents aren't buying it. That's why you got kids still listening to SoundCloud and like YouTube. That's also true. Because it's free. So it's like, if you have an older demographic on these streaming platforms because they're the ones that can afford it. Of course, the older music is going to be... Right. It's going to was hitting more. You know what I mean? Like, there has to be logistics behind it that actually make more sense than just, oh, older music's better than newer music. And on top of it, I think also what ties in, into that is that I hate generalizing it, but for the most part, everything kind of sounds the same and around this day and age. And I know technically there are people who make different types of music, but as far as like on the mainstream of what's put out there, everything in a sense kind of just sounds the same. And I think that has something to do with it. I as don't well. agree. I think that that's always been the case. Did I think, really? yeah, yeah. I think that you've always had artists that like fall into a certain niche, but they, we didn't have it as much access to. Them. Like once again, like back in those like the early right. 2000s, 2010s. Well, also even. they weren't going to sign you if you sounded just like another artist back then. But that's because it had nothing to do with the numbers. Those are just those were the artists that we weren't able to see or to be able to hear because the platforms weren't they weren't able to get on those specific platforms at those times. So well, there was I, I get no what you mean. data to back it. Yeah, like back in the day, if they were signing you. Like, maybe they knew your audience, but how could they really? There was no email. There was no, like, we're talking early 90s. Oh, we're talking about buying CDs and shit. They went yeah. off of talent. Like, they went off of, oh, this dude's dope. I think he's marketable. Let's sell him. But there was no, like, well, he has a million followers. Or he does a million streams per record. Like, yo, we're up against that now. So it's like, now it's easier to, to get signed off of any type of sound. Mm -hmm. because. As long as I have the data to back that my music works, you fuck with me. They'll sign me. Yeah, you fuck with me. Back then, it had nothing to do with that. So now, if if a label runs into Bills and they already signed 
this artist who sounds very similar to Bales, they'll say, uh, we don't need them. Exactly. Huh. We already have one. And I think that also ties in with the, just the fact of how things and shit was orchestrated back then. You really had to go, like, really be a fan fan of somebody, where more so they weren't, like, right there inside your pocket. Like, I remember they were talking about, like, you know, people would go to fucking MTV. Now, I, don't, I forgot what the fuck the name of the show was. I think his name was Carson Daly. And they would just, like, sit outside for, like, yeah. fucking TRL. T- numerous hours just trying to get on the fucking TV or, or just to see that the person they Me were looking the for. the fucking freezing cold, now, yeah. just staring up at a building. Now you go on live and you see your fucking favorite artist blowing their nose or just like doing weird shit on Instagram. There's just way more access to people as a whole. So I think that, and again, like with the numbers being uh, what they are, like if you, if you get to a certain number organically and it's mm-hmm. not all bought and I think that a label is likely to sign you, so... It's just not the same game anymore. And that could also speak to why, like, if you looked at the artists who were the originators of a sound, even the newer guys who, like, the first guy who came out with the sound and Mm. they're, like, the top guy in the game for that sound, Mm. I think if if you went back in time, those guys would still get signed. It's just that everyone who came after them who sounds just like them wouldn't get signed. No, that makes sense. You know what I mean? So the game has just shifted to where anyone could get signed with any sound as long as you have the data to back it. Yep. And that's why the the whole genre gets cheapened because now you have 50 people that sound exactly alike. And all the genres are basically meshed up. But once again, right. it's, it's like a double-edged sword because it's honestly really a positive thing for the most part, but then there's also those negative sides I think it's positive because well. everyone could work in the business. I don't think it's positive that you could sound like someone... X, Y, and Z and just like be... And just, yeah, blow up. Yeah. Because... That's, I don't know. I, I think that like originality in music is, it still holds value in my heart, at least. I don't know about Mine everyone's, too. but I think that like being the person, and that's why like when we have those discussions about like creating your own sound, mm-hmm. it's like that is important. And I guess what we're saying right now is kind of speaking to you can get signed without creating your own sound, but like you're going to remember the artist who did create their own sound. Exactly. There's a bunch of dope artists who like kind of followed, like Designer's a perfect example of someone who did get signed and he had good records. It's not like Designer had bad records. No, you're not going to tell me he had bad records. He had fucking smashes, bro. Panda and Timmy turn out love. Anything else? Uh, no, he had that, that one with the horns. I forget what the record was called, but it was a fucking. It was I a big ass. That. I don't yeah, know. It was song, a big I, ass. I remember the song though, but I it was did a great song. That. It had yeah. uh, Mike Dean production. Like it was a good song. Designer had records. He had the freestyle number four on Kanye's shit. Just technically bad label, bad. He had uh, what, what was the Kanye song that that had him at the end? Uh, was it Beautiful Morning? No, no he did. I, he did do Panda on Kanye's record, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. No, that was that was that was his record, but Kanye got No, him I know, it. but I'm saying like Kanye had him on his song doing the panda uh chorus. Yeah, yeah, I forgot what the name of the song yeah. was, but though, but it he was off of like Pablo. It, yeah. he, he basically was like, Yeah, this is my shit now. Right. <laughs> so I think that like even even going to designer, like you can be a successful copycat in today's day and age. Because how Kanye probably looked at it was like, maybe I don't want to pay Futures uh, feature price. Why not get designer? That's true. That's yeah, this guy sounds just like him. Why can't I just take him and get cheaper future? And you hooks? know what's crazy? I kind of forgot that the people were even making that comparison at a point because they are technically like completely different artists in my book and in my mind, but they did sound similar. And I kind of just really not even similar. I mean, they sounded exactly like. Well, the designer feature? Yeah. It's just a deep voice and just, yeah. No, it sounded exactly like. I, w- I would say, like, right now, the exact uh, comparison would be, there's a new guy named Dusty Locaine. That name sounds familiar. Okay, Dusty Locaine, he sounds almost exactly like Pop Smoke. Okay. Nah, he does the drill shit, mm-hmm. and it sounds exactly like Pop Smoke. I don't it's like, about, the industry is about. praising the guy, and he makes good music, so I have nothing against his music. I'm just saying... He sounds just like Pop Smoke. Yeah, no. <laughs> like for an artist to to pass away, and then for like a year or two later, someone to come out that sounds exactly, exactly like same. him, same voice. He's saying the same shit. Like that just shows you everything you need to know. Like they will embrace that. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Like they don't care if if uh, if you're a carbon copy. The industry just cares if your numbers are proper. They care about getting that fucking money. You know, but I think that the way you become a staple in the industry is by creating that own sound yeah. and making sure that you're unique. Because that's something we always say. It's like, yeah, you could definitely make it being like a carbon copy, but it's like, 
you know, if you're going to, that's how you get your money. I can't tell you how you not, not to get your money. But for me personally, I would want to have my own sound and create some shit where it's like more so I'm getting paid for the shit that I know is kind of come from me and not that I'm fitting like a mold or, you know, following the footsteps. But once again, get your money, how you get your money. But here's the thing with, with that, you can get in the, the door as a carbon copy. Would you say designer had a successful career? No. He's out of here already. I haven't heard a designer song that was intriguing in fucking how long. You know what I mean? So you can get in the door. You're not going to stay here. That longevity piece. Always you're just not going to stay here. Yeah. Like, there's no way to stay if you're a carbon copy. Because at some point, people are going to be onto it where it's like, I, if I want a future song, I'm going to listen to a future song. Especially if the artist is still active. Mm-hmm. You know, like a Dusty Locaine has the benefit of pop. It sucks, but he has the benefit of pop no longer being, being here. here. So there is no market. Because if they were both out, it would be like everybody's going to prefer to take 100%. Pop Smoke. 100%. They'd be like, yeah, the right. This, like, this guy is just trying to sound like Pop Smoke. We still have Pop Smoke to listen to. But now that Pop's not here. And you know what's crazy? I think they came out, not came out around the same time, but I think they were both rapping at the same time. But I never knew who he was until maybe I, he passed away. I think away. maybe a year later is when Dusty, like, came out so i think that i mean you could tell that he's influenced yeah it just, of course, it, of course. you know what i'm saying like there's no way that he's like no i didn't take anything from him it was just we just have the same voice like he might say that himself but there's no way to to make that stick and speaking of that now i'm starting to think about it uh all the artists that you know have passed away due to whatever circumstances may have been i don't think enough fans as far as like you know that new music coming in i don't think enough fans get get enough time to really attach to some of those artists that get kind of taken out of the game a little bit too early than they need to be taken out of. And 20 years from now, are they still listening to that same artist after so many other artists probably just came back up? It's hard to because they only gave you X amount of work and it's not like they were dropping classic albums. Exactly. Like, you look at a Biggie or Tupac, they dropped three classic albums, four classic albums. Pac had fucking endless projects and that's why they had such a... A, a long-lasting effect. Right, because it's like, there's enough music to back a long ass career. And technically, then Biggie only made like one or two albums before he, he technically three. passed well, away. He made, and then two, he made after two. He died. He made he made two before, and then I think one like right after he died. But it was like he was working on it while. Oh, okay, yeah. Before, it, so it's not but like, even then. It's still, it wasn't it's like still a posthumous hit. album. Like he had like the Biggie duets and shit like that. That was posthumous, where it wasn't really a. Uh, like a Biggie album. It was just like verses taken from his shit and put onto new beats. Yeah. You know, but I think, I think with a lot of the artists now, it's like, yeah, like our X, like Triple X and Pop, like they didn't really have a lot of music. So it's think- hard, it's hard to carry on a fan base that, that stretches into the next generation, the next generation. Cause like at some point your music is not enough to carry you. So it just drifts off. They get lost somewhere. Yeah, and, and I think that some people would disagree with us because they're such supporters of those artists. Which is fun. But in 10 years, no one's going to think about those artists. They might think about them like, oh, shit, he was dope. That sucks that he died. But they're not going to be like stands of that artist because you need that constant that piece. content to come out in order for you to like continue being a fan. If one of our favorite artists dropped an album and then was like, fuck this, I'm done, and then never dropped an album again... Within a couple of years, you're going to just stop being a fan. Yeah, like you'll probably revisit that shit, but that's probably some the most random time you revisit. Like, oh shit, I forgot this even existed. Right, exactly. Like, you're still going to rock with the music, but you're going to be like, well, what's the point? I don't need to f- support him or follow him because he's not even doing it anymore. Mm-hmm. Let me find the next guy that is going to keep on giving me content, you know? Um, so to cap off older music versus newer music, what do you think? Just find some balance. Try to get enough music out there where you get your name out there. Um, but at the same time, at a certain point, realize that once you got your feet in the door, you got that foundation set, look for a little bit more longevity um, and try to find a way to stay relevant some way, somehow, whether that be in music or outside of music, but still it's always t- a tie to your name in a sense. So just be able to find that balance so this way your music can go along with you. Yeah, and I'd say just like working on timeless records that being ahead of the trends Knowing that like certain sounds are here for a second and they're not going to be here in a couple of years, Mm -hmm. knowing that like if you get ahead of that and you start making records that will stick for the next five years, being proud of the records that you wrote five years uh, prior and still feeling like they hold value. Like those are things that I feel like artists could work on more um, knowing that, you know, I don't necessarily have to work on a record that is 
uh, New York Drill record just because New York Drill is popping right, right now, now, if it doesn't fit what I actually want to make as an artist, you know, make the shit that you like, make the shit that that stands true to you and make sure that that is something that you're proud of in the next uh, however long that's going to stick 10 years from now. Because a change is going to happen eventually. For sure. But um, to cap off my final thoughts on like older uh, music being more successful than newer music, I just think that it was the times. I just think that it has to do with uh, the label structure. I think that it, I just, I just think that it has to do with how it, how it was sold back then. I don't think it has to do with that music being necessarily better. I can agree with that. All right, cool. Uh, Rapper's Guy Podcast, episode 45. This is Diggy Metro. Bill's Pagliacci. Peace out, guys.